So yesterday, yesterday evening, uh, after the demos and drinks, we went with, the, uh, with uh, a couple of uh, esteemed customers from Northwell who are running a healthcare data warehouse on sharding, and we went to a Greek place. And we did talk a little bit about this, but because it was a Greek place, it easily became Calamar storage. I think that's, a nice, uh, that's also a nice term to, uh, to use in, in our future marketing. So columnar storage on InterSystems Iris. Um, what I'll be talking you through today is, uh, is going to be an overview of what, we, what the technology is for, if this clicker works again. It did work a second ago. So what we're going to be talking through is just um, an example of a customer that uh, also participated in our early access program um, from the other side of the, of the planet in Australia. Then I'll talk a little more about what is columnar storage and what is a lean data warehouse and how does it help you get the data where you want it to be in the shape that you want it to be. And then I'll happily pass the floor to Jose to talk a little more about what they did at Shift and they, because um, they went a lot further than, uh, than the, that initial pilot and they've, uh, they've really kind of pushed it to the limits and had built out a very involved benchmark. After that, I'll tell you a little more about where we, um, where we spend our time in the last year. Because last year at Global Summit, we first announced columnar storage, and we made it available as an experimental feature. But we, we haven't stopped there, obviously. We spend a lot of time in the past year to add more capabilities, um, make sure that you get the benefits from columnar storage throughout the query processing pipeline for all, any and all query patterns. So more about that in that section. And then at the end, I'll wrap up with um, a question that, I, that, I've, uh, that I've had already a number of times. So columnar storage is nice, but when do we have to use it? So there's no golden rules there, but I'll try and uh, do some of that in the, in the wrap up. So without further ado, let's uh, talk a little more about the, uh, the, a pilot that we did with a, a customer in, uh, in Australia. So anybody of you familiar with uh, TapCorp? Okay, great. So, uh, TapCorp is, uh, is one of our big customers in Australia, and uh, in Australia, what, um, you may know that people say mate all the time, um, but they also do a lot of gambling. There is, gambling is, mu is, is very popular in, in Australia, and gambling these days is no longer just in a, in a casino with, uh, with dice and, uh, and, and roulette uh, tables, but there's a lot of online gambling and a lot of technical uh, cap capabilities are required in order to support the... The, those, those different gambling workloads and, and betting and betting transactions. So the TAP Group is Australia's biggest um, multi-channel wagering brand. So they offer a broad set of services and a broad set of products to, to end users for gambling, but also services to event uh, organizers uh, and sports radios because uh, they, they offer a kind of sports betting. They offer uh, other types of uh, gambling and, and whatnot. So if you go to intersystems.com, and uh, look for TapCorp. You can see a really nice video from, with Alex Hill, their, uh, their chief architect, talking about their relationship with InterSystems because they've been using our technology for many, many years and are really happy about the stability uh, that our technology brings at the scale that they need it. Talking about which, the scale at which they need it. So CAM is the name of their system that processes transactions. And it's, um, it's it's the technology that they found was able to sustain the volume of, of transactions that are going through their, uh, their systems, even on the biggest sports event in uh, the whole of Australia, the Melbourne Cup. So that's uh, a horse race. The picture that I showed on the previous slide is from the Melbourne Cup. It's like the, like the Ascot race in, uh, in, the, in the UK, where women wear all kinds of fancy hats. Uh, but there's a, a, a very impressive amount of, uh, of betting taking place on Melbourne Cup Day. So that is, their, that is their traditional benchmark with which they, they test their scalability. They take the, the, the transactions that went or that happened on Melbourne Cup on the prior year, they, do, they multiply that by a certain safety factor and they see if, they, if the system can handle it in the, in the build up to the next Melbourne Cup. So as you can see, 400,000 transactions per minute, that's, uh, that's quite a bit. So a very amazing uh, technology. Um, and the technology is very transaction focused. So it's about placing bets and then uh, fulfilling those bets after the, after the event. Um, 
what they did not have as much in, that, uh, in the solution or in their application is, is analytics. They had like a, a separate system in which they could do some after the fact reporting, but they wanted to, do, they wanted to be able to do more real time analysis um, and extending that reporting to the, the actual data as it was, uh, as it was happening. So that the current schema is focused on supporting those 400,000 transactions a second. So um, most of the queries, so it's, it's really focused on ingestion and updates and, and, and quick transaction pro processing. So most queries where you wanna be able to analyze across a larger uh, data volume needed to be tuned quite a bit in order to get the performance that they wanted. They had a whole range of very specific indices to support that workload and always needed to be careful because every index that they add kind of slows down those 400,000 transactions that need to complete in a single minute. So, um, and they also were not really looking forward to building a wholly separate data warehouse because a separate data warehouse adds data latency and therefore uh, wasn't really an answer to their, uh, to their problem. So what we investigated with them um, was on a copy of like a one quarter worth of data, um, whether we could use some columnar indices and add columnar indices to their existing schema to their existing tables and see how that improved the performance of the analytical queries that they were interested in. So here are some of the, some of the results. So this is one of the, the three key queries that they presented to us. This query selects from the main transaction table, so the one that gets 400,000 new rows in a single minute during the peak times, to get all of the payment type transactions between a certain timestamp. And those, the, the time range would be uh, something that they would execute with, with varying time ranges. So they could ask for all of the transactions in, in 19 days, and that would give back, that would return 35 million rows. For one day, it's 4.4 million rows. So they would be doing that query for a number of different um, kind of ranges, and, and, and that has an impact, obviously, on, on the performance. As you can see, it's not super fast if you want, to, if you want it to return 35 million rows. But it was something that, was, that they did and that they presented to us as a challenge. So you can see in the, in the lighter shade there that that is one of the tricks that I mentioned that they, uh, that they took in order to make this query complete at all. So we're looking for all of the, the transactions that happen between two particular timestamps. Timestamps are uh, kind of, well, expressions of time that have a high level of detail that go up to uh, milliseconds or even lower than milliseconds, depending on what you're looking for. But that index was super big. That was an index that was, that was 200 megabytes in size. So if you need to go, if you need to retrieve a, a, a range of 19 days, there's a, a hell of a lot of, um, I think it was actually 200 gigabytes. I put that in the notes. No, 20 gigabytes. There you go. And so, so that's 20 gigabytes that they needed to scan in order to retrieve, or a fair portion of the, the, the 20 gigabytes that they needed to, to scan each time in order to retrieve the, the, the proper values. So what they did was they added an additional index that, is a bit, that was a bitmap index on the date, uh, the date field with a lower granularity so that they could also already start pre-selecting it. Um, so their, their schema was full of that kind of special indices and then special conditions added to the, the queries in order to make it complete in, uh, in an appropriate amount of time, just because of the sheer volume of data that was going through their, through their system. So when we replaced those indices with columnar indices, we saw that the transaction, uh, sorry, the timestamp index shrunk from over 20, over 30, gig, over 20 gigabytes to uh, just three gigabytes, or, sorry, I should have, remembered my numbers, two, three gigabytes, so that's a fair space saving. And you can see how much faster the queries actually went. The, the specifics obviously differ a little bit from, uh, from time window to time window, but this was without the transaction date column, so no specific tuning, no specific special purpose tricks and, uh, and, and indices required. So that was very worthwhile. So we did not get to uh, test with them the ingestion speed. They weren't, uh, we weren't able to work with that uh, Melbourne Cup uh, benchmark. But when uh, I pass the, the word to Jose, he'll be talking more about that kind, of, uh, that kind of more involved experiments that they did at Shift. Also, returning 35 million rows 
is not necessarily super, uh, super useful. So a user is not going to scroll through a list of 35 million entries. So we would also like to know more about what they were doing with that data subsequently, uh, because maybe some of that processing, some of the aggregations and calculations there could also be included in the query and further speed up the, 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 the added value that columnar could bring. So, I already kind of gave the, the answer to this question away. So did they need a data warehouse in order to satisfy their analytics needs? Not really. What they were looking for was not a data warehouse, but an, an agile way of getting the data from where it lives into a shape or form that is useful for the analytics use case um, with minimizing latency and uh, minimizing the, the date, or sorry, the, the, uh, the space that was taken for this because you can't keep adding indices uh, forever. So that data supply chain is what we're gonna talk about here. Getting the data from the format that it's in into a representation that can be used for analytics that kind of meets the, the performance and latency needs of the, of the customer without much overhead. So this is what we, wanna, what we want to offer. So in a, in a more concrete, uh, terminology. So what we mean when we say the lean data warehouse, that is a, um, it doesn't have to be a physical warehouse, it's an analytic fo analytics focused model that you can query um, that delivers high performance query capabilities on very large data sets and that offers you the flexibility that you need in order to meet those analytics, uh, analytics requirements. And also it's very efficient at it without wasting space, without wasting time and ideally in a, in a single data supply chain technology. I'm using a couple of fuzzy words there, but it's really to stress the fact that we're not taking data from one place and dumping it to an, in another place. We're really offering you a lot more flexibility to kind of bring the data to you when you need it, where you need it, at very high performance. That is what we mean when we say the lean data warehouse. The same point, the same data. Yes. So, great because of this. So when, we, when I say a customer-focused model, I make the distinction between the data producer and the data consumer. So the data producer is our application. In the case of uh, TapCorp, it was the application that was generating 400,000 transactions per minute. It generates those transactions not in bulk. Uh, people make bets individually. Uh, so that's one row going into the system. Somebody wants to see the bets that he opens. Um, he retrieves one, two, two, three, four, five rows from the database. You want to update or close a bet that's also operating on just a handful of rows. So in such an application scenario, in such an OLTP scenario, you're always working with data on a row-by-row -row basis. And that's how traditionally on InterSystems Iris we've stored data. However, for that analytics use case, you're not necessarily interested in the, the, the individual row level detail. You're interested in getting the aggregate. You want to know how many bets were placed in the past five minutes, or what is the average size of a bet, or what is the average risk ratio of, uh, of a particular time segment full of worth of bets. And so you're going to be looking at individual columns. You're going to be looking at aggregates of those columns. Um, and that's using the data in a column-by-column -column, uh, manner. And that's more an OLAP, an online analytical processing type of use case, in contrast with an OLTP use case. So we want a customer-focused, uh, a consumer-focused model uh, for our, our database. So to implement this, we're having our table at the logical level. Um, in our application scenario, we're storing it row by row. So you, you heard, um, Terry, and then this morning, uh, Jeff talk about uh, global references. So we will, every global reference corresponds to a single row. We store all of the values for one row in one global. That works well for the OLTP use case, but for the analytics, we're gonna do it differently. In columnar storage, we're going to store the data column by column. So now we're going to group the data, not just with all of the data for one row together in one global reference, but all of the data for one column under one global reference. Of course, if you're talking about a billion rows, that's starting to get a, big, a little big. So we chunk it up in, uh, in, in groups of uh, 64,000 uh, values. And that's what we store in, uh, in columnar storage. 64,000 
row values for a single column. So, so that's at the macro level. So at the macro level, we are, oh, sh that was quick. <laughs> that's, that's a columnar storage speed. <laughs> a clicker is keeping me on my toes. All right, so that was the, that's sort of looking at the, the storage of your, of your data at the macro level. So rather than storing it row by row, we're storing it column by column. So now let's look more at that micro level. How is it physically stored? What is this, this these simple PowerPoint uh, shapes? What are they, what do they correspond to when you're looking at it at the object, object script level? So we've, that's what we call the encoding, the encoding of values, putting them together in your, uh, in your global reference. So for row storage, we use lists. Lists are very flexible. They support any data type. They, are, they have optimizations for null values, and they're optimized for variable uh, access uh, patterns. So whether you want to have the, the, the last or the first entry, or whether you want to have a subsection of your, uh, of your list, that's all the kind of things that you would typically do with a list that are relevant for row storage. In columnar storage, the use cases are different. The way how we're going to use it the data is different. So also the way how we're going to encode the data can be different. In a column, all of the, all of the values will have the same data type because they're in the same column. So your patient IDs are always going to, if, in, if your patient IDs are an integer column, well, all of the values are going to be integers. So you can take advantage of that in your specific encoding and use something that works well for, for integers. And we would use something different for strings and yet something different for timestamps. We're also talking about bulk access patterns. Bulk access such as give me the aggregate of this entire column, optionally limited through a mask. And also we want to optimize for repeating values and null values. So those are some of the things that we put in place for the way how we store our data in a, in a columnar format. So slightly different requirements and therefore a different data type with different optimizations. Great, so we've stored our data in in a format that is fit for analytics um, with a very smart encoding that makes it very efficient and kind of low footprint. Now we've got to use it. We've got to use it in queries and make sure those queries are fast. As you saw in the, in the, the, the keynote this morning, um, it can be really fast. So in order to explain what that is, I will very carefully use the clicker to, um, <laughs> to show you how query execution works. And if I don't explain it properly, you can always go and see our uh, esteemed developers in the, in the tech exchange. We've got a couple of them in the back of the room. And uh, Aviel is actually going to give a talk uh, about it at, uh, at four, which overlaps with this session, which is slightly inconvenient, but anyway. So how does query execution look in a row-by-row -row model, in a classic uh, inter-systems iris or practically any other uh, database model that uses, that is focused on uh, OLTP? So we will first, get the next row from the global, then we will get the value that we want to sum up. So, sorry, I forgot to say, I'm going to select sum from whatever, uh, whatever table. So I'm going to calculate a big aggregate over my table. So first, get the next row. Then from that list of values, I get the value that corresponds to the column that I want to sum up. And then I'm going to add that value, update, it, uh, update my running sum in the, the white um, square, and then I move on to the next row, I get the corresponding value for that row, I update the sum, and so on, and so on. Very straightforward. Those of you that have um, used object scripts, you can probably picture how that looks in, uh, in, in code. Now, what are we going to do in the columnar case? How does a columnar query look like? So we like to call that vectorized query execution. That's not a name that we invented, it's actually a, a well-known pattern or a well-known paradigm in, uh, in, in the, the SQL world. So what we do here is we get the next chunk of values from a global. So that's 64,000 values crammed together in a specific encoding that works well for, uh, for that particular data type. That specific encoding in columnar storage in Iris also comes with highly optimized vector operations to sum up the entire chunk. Um, and that sum for that chunk, we, we, use, we use it to update our running total. And then we move on to the next chunk. We sum up the chunk and we update the sum. At first sight, that looks a little bit similar to what we have on the left-hand side. But please don't forget that 
we are not looking at just one individual row, but we're looking at 64,000 rows at a time. Okay, the vector operation to calculate the sum of a whole, uh, of a whole vector is going to take a little more time than just summing up to, uh, to scalar values, but that is absolutely, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the, the 64,000 factor, that is absolutely not weighing up. Another interesting thing is that we only read the relevant columns. So if I have a very broad table, which is typical in data warehousing, um, and I'm only summing up one column, why would I read the entire row? I'm only interested in one column. So that's another advantage of uh, vectorized query processing. Those vector operations also make use of SIMD instructions. So they've been implemented by uh, some of our smart developers in the, in the kernel group uh, to take advantage of auto-vectorization capabilities in modern compilers that take advantage of SIMD instructions, single instruction, multiple data uh, instructions in the, at the chipset level. So we're really kind of exploiting some of the advances in, uh, in, in, in low-level compiler and, and, uh, and hardware. And then also, the way how we divide the work in these chunks is making it very easy for us to parallelize that work because you can independently work on multiple chunks uh, at a time and then just aggregate those values afterwards. So those are some of the advantages of vectorized query processing with InterSystems Iris. And then, um, very important actually, um, we do not for we've implemented this in our existing uh, SQL engine. We've implemented this in our existing Iris data platform. This is not a separate database. This is, not, this is not a separate engine that we have on the side and we kind of shuffle data in between the two. No, this is a single engine that just uses columnar storage as another abstraction of how you, uh, how you store your data or how you index your data. So that means that we cannot just offer the classic data warehouse or analytical database paradigm of storing all of your data in columnar, but we can give you a lot of choices. We can give you the, uh, the choice to uh, add a columnar index, uh, a bit like where you would use a bitmap index or a regular index or a bit slice index in the past, on a regular row organized table. And we can even, within a single table, identify certain columns that are stored in storage, in columnar storage, and other columns that are stored in row storage. For example, if you have uh, long string fields or even stream fields, it doesn't make any sense to store those in, uh, in, a, in a columnar format. You're not going to calculate the average of a text, uh, of a text field. So there, there's no uh, particular benefit in, in storing them that way. But we offer you an, an unparalleled uh, level of flexibility here. And the, the end goal of that is making analytical queries 10 times faster. You saw in the keynote how we made the, the specific uh, report query. We brought it down from 70 seconds to five seconds. And if you, if you would run the query itself and not just the report, you would also lose kind of a fixed cost of rendering the report, which is one or two seconds. So if you, um, if you don't trust me, you can see it on my laptop if, uh, if, you, if you want. So um, we, can get it, we can get that result in three seconds, uh, in fact. All right. With that, I am very happy to uh, welcome Jose and uh, have him talk a little more about, uh, please don't forget your microphone, uh, about the work that they've done at, uh, at Shift. Yeah. You want to use the clicker? Oh, so first, thank you, Benjamin, for having me. And it's a pleasure to be here, and for Shift also. Uh, and we'll talk uh, how we did columnar storage at Shift. But Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'm closer to you. Thank you. So first, let me introduce Shift Company. So we are the Brazilian leading provider for LIS. Um, we process more 37 million clinical tests annually, which represents 20% of the Brazilian market share. Um, some of our customers have more uh, about 3,000 concurrent users in our ECP clusters and we provide transactional and analytical solutions using a combination of inter-systems technologies. So, um, last year in Global Summit 2022, we uh, are presented to the early adopter program for columnar storage, as, and as we have to process a huge amount of data, uh, such, function, such feature uh, 
seems very interesting to us. So we try to decide to try in, in our uh, actual queries. So we uh, we uh, select some aggregation, query some analytical queries in our system um, using one of the one of our biggest tables um, and try to and decide to try. Uh, the queries uh, in using columnar storage, but also we, as we need to provide uh, analytical and transaction, we also decide to uh, test uh, how crude operations uh, are impacted by columnar storage. So, um, as I said, we we select some queries and get the tables of these queries and. Uh, uh, make copies of these tables using columnar storage and uh, the same tables uh, using the original indices and perform queries and insert and update operations. Uh, got the three metrics in order to compare and decide where to use columnar storage and where to uh, and, and evaluate the impact on crude operations. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, Heather, Heather then test queries in isolation. We model a uh, working unit that has representative for our, our largest customers. So we prepare a mix of queries, batch inserts and updates, and simulate those, uh, those operations on an uh, environment system uh, simulating concurrence users, actually 5,000 users. Um, and as I said, we, we select three measures, three metrics, measure uh, time, uh, global reference, and command executed to, uh, to measure uh, the, the, the performance. Uh, and also, we, uh, we try to not create a specific schema for uh, columnar storage. We would like to test how to use our current tables using columnar storage. So uh, we got two tables. Those tables had a similar number of fields, um, also a similar number of original indices. One of those class, this is, this is very important for us because one of those queries uses hierarchy and another feature is like MEV um, for the legacy system. So we, we and, and, the, and, and is one of the biggest tables, so we are very uh, curious to, to know, to test how columnar storage uh, affect also some kind of um, table setup. And in order to test columnar storage, we have to uh, add some columnar indices, one for the table one, four for the table two. Um, Sorry, the additional indices. No, we need we need to change the storage default of the the do do some columns and also add, add, uh, add some uh, columnar indices. And our results was very 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 good. So for the query, we have a significant speed up for the table one. Um, is a simple uh, analytical query, just a sum. Um, and as, as you can see, we have uh, five times, five times better time. Also, we have some, uh, the, the gains on GHEFT and commands were limited because we use mixed storage. Uh, and gains in the, despite of the, the, the time in the, in the second table, being about three times better, we could have be even better results by uh, coming join optimizations. Um, and for the table two, global reference and common executed uh, was doing some, some, more, some more work. And for and the other side, so for queries, we are expecting uh, I speed up, but uh, here is what we are looking for. Uh, insert and update operations. 
for inserts, we, uh, we can see that the, for time, there are practically no difference between the two tables. So we, we see some benefit actually for columnar storage, but this is so little that, that this seems like noise, not actually a kind of um, uh, improvement. Um, and important to say that all the original indices were, were uh, still present in the tests. So uh, when, when we perform insert using columnar storage, we need to uh, update not only the columnar storage, but also uh, all the preview indices that had in the original table. And the indices in the original table for table two are bitmap indices. So we see uh, expressive improvement over uh, bitmap index. Uh, however, for update, we had we 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 observed some um, some worsening here. Uh, so as you can see in the second second chart in the table one, the time for performing updates were uh, was a little was uh, bigger. So and we also have an unclear anomaly for the table one but the numbers in absolute was very low. Well, Jose, uh, thank you so much for all the work that you and uh, Fernando have been doing together. It was yeah, very exciting yeah, yeah, to yeah, see yeah. How, you, uh, how you really took this yeah. uh, all by yourself and, and, and worked with your application schema rather than in a, an inter-systems lab with, uh, with kind of made up data. So that was, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I already mentioned last year in, uh, in Seattle, we first announced it. Um, what have we done in the past year? What have we done since that initial experimental release and the, the release in, uh, in 23.1 that you can use today for, in, in production environments and in the, what is coming up still, what's still in the development pipeline that, we're, uh, that we've been working on in the past uh, couple of uh, months? So the first thing, is uh, the vectorized hash join. So that sounds really cool, and it really is cool. I'm not sure if any one of you has uh, watched Robert Costa's presentation in the, in the Tech Exchange yesterday, but it was, uh, so um, he's the, the one that's been doing uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the heavy lifting on this. So what is the, the problem that we try to attack? So joins are when you combine data from two different tables, and um, those are traditionally very costly operations. Those are uh, the, the kinds of things that can make or break your, uh, your, your, your query, uh, a join that, that doesn't work well or isn't properly indexed. It's traditionally very implemented in a very row-oriented fashion. You first kind of build a temp file that contains all your, your target rows, and then you try and match that. So it's a, it's a very row-by-row -row kind of process. So that sounds like a candidate, um, an exciting challenge to try and optimize uh, with a vectorized uh, approach. So where you can use those auto vectorization in the compiler and those SIMD instructions. And so that's what we set about building. So uh, a dedicated vectorized operation, the vector joiner uh, module that Rob built, that also leverages those SIMD instructions. Um, and in it, we built, uh, we used uh, a hash join with open addressing, which is a, a specific format. I won't go into too much uh, details because that might get embarrassing, but Rob is still around and can get you, uh, give you more, a little more detail. But this is an example of a query that I run um, using the classic join and then uh, enabling the, the vectorized hash join. And you can see that that makes an enormous difference in the, the, num in the amount of work that's, uh, that's going on. So just to give you an idea of how it looks in, in, in code format. So what you do typically in, a, in when you're building a, or when you're executing a, a hash join is you're gonna pick the smallest table and then you will create a hash table that contains the, the row data. You will build a hash table. So for each chunk in our, um, in our first table, we will feed that to the joiner. In the background, it will start building the, the hash table. So it will use vectorized operations to calculate the hash of the join key. And then once you've built your, your, uh, your, your, your hash table, you will look at the, the join table. So that's the bigger table, the orange one there. And you will um, chunk by chunk 
join that to, the, uh, to, to what's already pre-populated in that hash table. And then, so the join is kind of feeding it in, and then with the probe next, you're going to get the results back out. So that's a separate operation, because you might have more results than the number of rows that you, uh, you actually put in. So that's sort of the, the, the methodology or the logic uh, behind the, the hash join. And again, if you're interested in more details, Rob and the rest of the SQL team is uh, hanging around in the tech exchange, so you can uh, definitely get to them with, uh, with questions if you want. So the hash joiner is in 23.1. We have a couple of optimi optimizations that we're still finishing up that will go into, the, into future uh, releases. Then a the second problem is ingestion speed. So um, these smart columnar encodings, what I, which I mentioned that were exploiting the data type that optimize for repeating values and that optimize for null values. So those are all super cool, but they are a little costly to, uh, to, to calculate, to build. So um, what we would like to do is making sure that we can build them in the most efficient fashion, and that is in batches. So we can do that if all of the data is already on iris, such as when building a columnar index based on existing data. But when you're ingesting the data, the data comes from the client, and traditionally the client would be submitting that row by row. So what we've done now is that we're doing some client-side buffering and partial encoding already on the client side, which was something that we were already doing in our highly optimized JDBC and ODBC drivers for row organized data. And now we've also implemented that for, uh, for columnar. So what you see in the dark blue is what we, how columnar looked um, or, well, how Columnar still looks in the, the release 23.1 uh, release, because this is something that's still uh, uh, yet, to be, uh, yet to be released. But, if we, but after implementing this optimization, you can see a dramatic decrease in the ingestion time. So it's going much, much, much faster, and we're offloading work from the server to the client. So if you're ingesting from multiple, uh, from multiple clients, that's an additional, uh, an additional benefit. And you can see that still the row ingestion is, uh, is, is a little faster, but that's straightforward. That's kind of, a, that's, that's kind of almost scientific. Um, Dave still has a couple of things that he and Jim are working on that may further reduce the difference, but we think that this is already very, very reasonable for the, the, the performance that you get on the query side at the other end of the, of the story. And then the third optimization that we've, spend, we've been spending a lot of time on in the, in the kernel group then is the efficient reading and writing of columnar data. So I talked about the macro level of the uh, encoding uh, of, the, of, of how we organize columnar data. I've also talked about the micro level, so how we use these, the, the data encoding. Uh, now this is a level below, so this is the nano level. So this is how those encoded values correspond to blocks in the database. So in the database, for big strings and big binary things like uh, the, the columnar data that we store, we, um, we will allocate consecutive blocks to the extent possible, and those are called big string blocks. Traditionally, we've read um, big string blocks on a one-by-one on a one basis. Now, in a, in a recent enhancement that's going to be part of the 23.2 release, we will read the entire chunk in one go. So if, you, uh, if, if we know that you're going to read a big string. You're probably going to read it from start to end. So we will use an async I.O. Uh, to read in one big operation all of the blocks that are concerned with, uh, with this, uh, that have data for this, for this columnar chunk. And then the second change in the same area is when we're reading or writing individual values, we can figure out which is the actual block that had that value and only read or update the, the value. So if we're not if we're not reading the whole vector for creating a sum or an aggregate, but if we're updating an individual value or inserting an individual value, we can now significantly limit the, the, the amount of I.O. that's needed and therefore the amount of time that's needed for, for that operation. So those are three projects that we've been uh, spending a lot of time on in the past six to nine months uh, and for which you'll hopefully be, uh, be seeing the benefits when you, uh, when you try out columnar storage in the future. So it's about time to wrap up so that there may be some room for questions if you have them. This could be one question. When should I use columnar storage? So I, I wrote this in a, in a developer community article. If you're interested, the URL's at the bottom. So if your schema is focused entirely on analytics, then just go ahead and use it as the default layout for all of your table. And we will automatically figure out 
if you are, uh, if there's any stream columns or long strings, we will under the hood revert to, to row storage so that you don't run into any, uh, any trouble there. Um, but that's definitely what we recommend if you're, uh, if you're building a new schema for, uh, for analytics. If your application includes operational analytics, so if you're, if you're an operational application, such as was the case for Shift, as was the case for TapCorp in Australia, and as I'm sure is gonna be the case for a lot of you, um, you have an existing application running fine in, uh, in, in row format. Check if you're, you're doing analytical queries on it that might see benefits from these highly optimized vectorized query executions. So typically bitmap indices would be a good uh, indication uh, but bitmap index indices are especially good for filtering, but you can't use them for aggregates. You can't necessarily use them for grouping, uh, grouped aggregates, et cetera. So those are cases uh, where you want to look for, uh, for a columnar index. Also for timestamp fields or uh, numeric fields with precision, um, those are not good use cases for bitmaps, but they are good ones for columnar indices. If that works well, you can also consider to kind of shift left and use that, use columnar as the primary storage for those fields. So for example, if it's, the, if it's a numeric field that's only ever used for aggregations, that might be something that you could consider. And if you don't have any analytic queries that, that kind of fit this, uh, this purpose, you're, you're gonna be fine with just, uh, with, just, uh, with just row storage for operational scenarios. That is definitely still what we would recommend. Also, if you're still in, uh, using small data volumes, less than a million rows or the low millions, then the added value of columnar storage may also not manifest in, uh, in, in such a spectacular fashion. So, um, but you'll get other benefits that we've, uh, that we've outlined. For example, the ones on the, last, uh, on the last slide with the big string blocks. All right, I wanna close with this one. So with columnar storage on InterSystems Iris, we can we can meet you where you want to be. We can give you the analytics where you want them. Do you want them in a data warehouse? We can do that. We can give you full columnar layout for your table. Do you want just analytical query speed? Um, then we'll, we'll kind of do the lean thing and just add columnar indices on the fields that, you are, uh, that are required to, to give you those, uh, those fast analytical queries. So that is what we do with an unrivaled flexibility in schema design and also with very efficient low-level encodings on the storage side, very efficient low-level implementations of the operations on the, on the query execution side. To get started, download a 23.1 kit. Um, it's part of the community edition uh, if you wanna try it out. It's, uh, and otherwise, you can request an advanced server license for an evaluation if you're interested. Um, and as you saw this morning in the keynote demonstration, it's transparently taken advantage of by all our other uh, applications that use SQL. With that, I still have a minute or two for, for questions. Anybody has? So, Any? so the, the question is, do the, can we uh, use these different index types simultaneously? And the answer is absolutely yes. That is one of the distinctive advantages of, uh, of columnar, of the way how we implemented it. You can just mix and match all, uh, all, all index types. And the optimizer will try and figure out which combination is most useful. Um, especially bitmap indices work really well together with columnar storage. So if you, if you have a low cardinality field, like with, with, uh, with state or country, with very few different values, and you only use it for filtering, a bitmap index is perfect for that scenario. But then the, 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 the population or the, 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 the price field that's next to it, that wouldn't work for a bitmap. Other questions? Which aggregate functions do you use per chunk? You, you mentioned uh, some, right? How about average? Um, so, so we have sum, we have count, which makes average. We've got min, we've got max. Uh, we've got grouped variants of those uh, so that you can also feed in a vector to, to group by in the, in the same time. So those are the, the, the main ones that we've implemented this far, but we have a, a bunch of others that we're, uh, we're interested in, uh, in, in applying. That's an excellent, that's an excellent question. So how to convert an existing table into a columnar one? So we, you, you're um, bringing up a roadmap item. The, 
uh, alter table T convert column from uh, to, to columnar storage. That literally is a, a command that we have in the works that we would like to, to implement. Right now, our recommendation would be start off with columnar indices, as I, as I had on the previous slide, if this is not going to go back too far. Yes. So start off with, uh, with columnar indices. You can also toggle their selectability, as you saw Carmen demonstrate in the, in the presentation this morning. So those are perfect for experimenting. And then we can work with you to, uh, to, to, to get that conversion going. So, but it is something that's going to be finding its way into uh, maybe the 23.3 release uh, and otherwise uh, the, first, the first next uh, release. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Does, um, does it take long to build the column of storage? So it, we, we have very large tables. So, you know, 5 billion, 17 billion <laughs> records. Is it, is it the same as building a regular index, or does it take any longer? It depends a little bit on and the... how wide the table is, and how it, does it make any dif difference? Does that matter? So, um, it does not matter how wide the table is right. if you're building an individual index. In the, so okay. to give you an example, so you, the, the, in the, the demo environment that we used for this morning's presentation, it has a billion rows, and we have three columnar indices. To build those three indices, um, takes 103 seconds um, on that. That's a fairly reasonable server that we have in, a, in our Cambridge office. So that's, that's how long it took for, to, to grind through it. So if you look at that, the query that we ran, it took 70 seconds. And the query was already using a filter, uh, was, was only looking, was going through a, a, bitmap, uh, a bitmap filter to, to start off uh, to begin with. So, uh, the, just 100 seconds for a full table scan and building the indices is definitely not too, uh, definitely not too bad. Okay. One last question before we close. All right. Well, thanks again. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks again, Jose. And, uh,